Good evening, everybody. Uh, we're going to begin with our opening dialogue. Welcome to. Can you believe we're in? It's almost. We're almost done with Lent. We got one more week left. Isn't that scary? Uh, where did all the time go? Uh, so um, come on in, grab a seat. Uh, we begin with our opening dialogue. And your opening dialogue there is on your uh, is on the bulletin. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Turn us again, O God of our salvation. That the light of your grace may shine on us. May your justice shine like the sun. Glory be to God. Our opening hymn is by the Babylonian rivers. Continue with the thanksgiving for light. And could I get that F, Dave? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you called light into being, and you set lights in the sky to govern night and day, in a pillar of cloud by day, in a pillar of fire by night. You led your people into freedom, enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, for you are merciful and you love your whole creation, and with all your creatures we give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We continue with Psalm 121, which we shall read responsively. I lift up my eyes to the hills, from where is my help to come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord will not let your foot be moved, nor will the one who watches over you fall asleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The Lord will preserve you from all evil. The Lord will keep your life. The Lord will watch over your whole life and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. A 
our reading tonight comes from Revelation chapter 18, verses 1 through 8 and 21 through 24. It's Revelation chapter 18. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his splendor, and he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. It has become a dwelling place of demons and a haunt of every foul spirit and a haunt of every foul bird and a haunt of every foul and hateful beast. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people so that you may not take part in her sins, so that you do not share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her as she herself has rendered, and repay her double for her deeds, mix a double drought for her in the cup she has mixed. As she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, so give her a measure of torment and grief. Since in her heart, she says, I rule as queen, I am no widow, and I will never see grief. Therefore, her plagues will come in a single day, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned with fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, With such violence, Babylon, the great city, will be thrown down and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and minstrels and flutists and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And an artisan of any trade will be found in you no more. And the sound of the millstone will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were your magnates of the earth And all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in you was the blood of the prophets and of the saints, and all who have been slaughtered on earth. The word of the Lord. So I know after a reading like that, that's one of those readings where I say, the word of the Lord, and everybody wants to go, thanks be to God? (laughs) I know. I promise there's a lot of good news actually in this reading but we got to get there first, and like we have to go through Good Friday before we get to Easter, we got to go through the really bad news first before we get to the good news in this passage. All right, so I'm going to start off with a lot of depressing stuff. I promise I won't end there. Make sense to everybody? Okay. So I've been saying every week, you're probably tired of me saying this, but um, I'm going to say it, and I'm going to say it again because I want you to get it. Uh, There are three basic rules for interpreting the book of Revelation, right? The first is that the entire book is symbolic. The second is that the entire book is pastoral, means it's meant to answer your, your spiritual questions. And the entire book is about the here and now, not just a prediction of the future, but it's about the here and now and how we live in the here and now as Christians. And I actually think this reading is a good summary of all three of those things, how, how this book is both symbolic and pastoral and about the here and now, not just the future. But before we talk about Revelation, we've got to talk about our world for a second, because I think to make sense of this reading, we've got to talk about our world. So here's some pretty sad and earth-shattering statistics I've, I've read in the last uh, couple weeks. Um, The first is that the New York Times reported last week that uh, alcohol-related deaths spiked 25% during the first year of pandemic. 25%. The Washington Post reported that from May of 2020 to May of 2021, there were 81,000 drug overdoses, which represents something like a 20% increase. Uh, from the year before, and among those was a 38% rise in fentanyl deaths. Brown University did a study which showed that during the first year of the pandemic, depression rates tripled just in one year. 
So I say all this to say that we live in the wealthiest, most powerful, most technologically advanced society the earth has ever seen. There's no disputing that. And yet, deep down, when we read statistics like that, I think what they do is they confirm for us the awful truth, and that's that there is something critically wrong with a society that experiences alcoholism and death and depression on that scale. That there's just, it just reveals something wrong deep down underneath it all. Even though on the surface, yeah, right, we all got these wonderful things. Where's mine? We all got these... This has more power than the entire computer that put, put the astronauts on the moon, <laughs> right? You know, I mean, we have all these wonderful technological devices. We all have all this money. You know, we're a very wealthy society. We have plenty, right? You know, there's lots of food available. But something deep down underneath we kind of know is wrong. So that's for us. So we got to get back to the book of Revelation. The thing you have to understand about the Roman Empire is the Roman Empire had censors. Uh, and that was actually an official job title in the Roman Empire, the censor. And one of the jobs of the censor was to make sure that what was being written by people wasn't subversive in any way, shape, or form. That it didn't take a dig at the Roman Empire, right? So Christians, we Christians had these crazy beliefs, right? We had these crazy beliefs, like the emperor wasn't a god. Who would believe that? And we have these crazy beliefs, like Jesus is Lord and not the emperor. And so to say these beliefs, the ancient Christians had to write in code, because it's the only way they could get their writings past the censor. Make sense to everybody? So this is all to say that when the Bible talks about, when the New Testament especially talks about Babylon, Babylon is almost always a code word for Rome. Babylon is the word for Rome. It's the word that the Christians use to describe what Rome was. That just as ancient Babylon in the Old Testament was the place of exile that had conquered God's people, similarly Rome was this place of exile that was against God's people in some way. And Rome in its day was the largest city on earth. It was actually the first city in history to reach a million people. It was also the most beautiful city on earth. Many commentators at the time described it as a city of white marble. But kind of like us in our society, the New Testament authors knew that underneath all that beauty and all that power and all that size, that underneath it all, there was something critically wrong with Rome. Because Rome was also violent. They actually watched gladiator games for fun, right? I mean, you think NFL football's bad, right? But people actually died in these games, and they liked it. And Rome is oppressively rich. You want to talk about 1% and 99%. Well, that's what this society is. It is the true, there is 1%. If you're a senator or above, you're wealthy, and everybody else is on poverty level. And there was even a saying in ancient Rome that Rome would like to brag that it bring peace to the whole world. But there was a saying that what the Romans, that what Rome did is they made a desert and they called it peace. They killed everything and they made it a desert and they called it peace. So something is critically wrong with Rome. The New Testament authors know this. And our book, and our reading from Revelation knows this knows that there is something critically wrong with Rome. And your reading actually put it this way in verse 1 and 2. Uh, it said in verse 2 uh, that it, that's Babylon, remember, remember, Babylon means Rome. So Babylon has become a dwelling place of demons, a haunt of every foul spirit, a haunt of every foul bird, a haunt of every foul and hateful beast. I don't even know what a foul bird is, but it sounds bad. Worse yet, that corruption is not limited to one place. That what's critically wrong with Babylon or what's critically wrong with Rome is, is going on everywhere that Rome goes. And so... 
also in your Revelation reading, For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxury. That's talking about Babylon, which is Rome, talking about the effect that all that wealth and all that power has on all the other places in the empire and all the other places that are under Rome's control that it's corrupt from the very beginning to the very end. Another way to put this, big business and the politicians in most of our communities are infected by the same disease that Babylon is infected by, infected by the same disease that Rome is infected by. That's what Revelation is trying to tell you. Okay, so that's the bad news. And everybody here is about to get up and leave, right? Because you're like, Pastor... I need some help here, <laughs> right? I can see it on Gloria's face. <laughs> okay, so you're thinking, Pastor, what's the good news? Actually, this reading opens up then with good news, right in verse 1. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. The good news that for all of Rome's armies, for all of the wealth that Babylon has, for all of its power and its violence, guess what? The lamb who was slain that we read about last week still has had the victory, was still raised from the dead, and that all that sickness that spreads from Rome, that all of it will end, and Easter and Good Friday prove this. And in an ultimate sense, this is the purest form of the good news. The problem is never so great that it is beyond God's power to repair, and the sickness is never so strong that it is beyond God's power to heal, and the injustice is never so grand that it is beyond God's power to work justice for, and no death is ever beyond a resurrection. This is good news. Then we come to verse 4. Verse 4 has another, the second bit of good news in this reading. Because in verse 4, the angel says, O oh, my people, come out of her, that is, come out of Babylon, so that you may not take part in her sins. So you should hear this as an invitation, not as a threat, right? When I was a kid, I used to ask, my mom would say something to me, and I used to ask, Is that a threat or a promise? My mom would say, Both. <laughs> But this isn't a threat. This is pure promise. This is pure invitation. It's pure gospel. All my people come out of her. That is, come out of Babylon. Basically, what the book of Revelation is trying to tell us is, guess what? You get to leave Babylon. You don't have to stay. You don't have to stay in this culture. Leave it. Abandon that culture. The trick with Babylon or with Rome or even with our culture is that it kind of seems all-encompassing, right? Sociologists describe this as totalizing. That is, that it seems like there's no way out. If you know the band, the Eagles, right? You know Hotel California? And when sometimes we feel like Babylon is kind of like the Hotel California. You can check out any time you want. Yeah, see some of you. But you can never leave, Right? It kind of seems like that with Babylon and with Babylon's culture, that there's no way out, right? We all, have, we all have to be this anxious, right? We're anxious all the time, and we all have to be this anxious because haven't you seen that's the only way that we know we can earn God's love is if we're trying hard enough. And we all have to be, we have to be so overworked that we turn to alcohol. Because after all, how am I going to pay my mortgage? And we have to drive our kids insane with all their after-school activities. Because after all, how are they going to get a good job and get into a good school and have that perfect life? And we all have, and we have to drive ourselves nearly to the point of insanity with our endless to-do lists that never get any smaller. Has anybody managed to have a to-do list that actually ends? <laughs> that was for effect. <laughs> we all have to work and work and work and work and never actually rest. But 
all of that is Babylon thinking. All of that is Rome thinking. All of that is, is living like we're living in Babylon. So what God says in verse 4 to us, to you, to me, to the Christians that are living at this time that John is writing to, what God is trying to say to all of us is, you know, you don't have to stay in Babylon. God is saying you don't have to live there. You don't have to live in Rome. You can actually take a rest. In fact, there's a whole commandment about it. Take your Sabbath rest. You know what? You don't have to pretend like forgiveness and love is earned. It's given. I give it to you daily. It's given. You don't have to live like Babylon. You don't have to be driven insane by your own anxiety, worrying about everything. Jesus actually says it. Don't worry. God provides enough rain for the flowers. He loves you enough to provide enough. The whole point of this is an invitation that invites us out of Babylon and into the way God wants us to live. It invites us out of Babylon thinking and into this world that's not driven by anxiety or hate or violence or fear, but into this world that is driven by God's love and by God's grace. And that's why the angel says, come out of Babylon. Now there's a catch. There is a catch. I'm sorry. The catch is this. We don't actually want to leave Babylon behind. The dirty little secret is we actually kind of like Babylon. We actually kind of like Babylon thinking in certain ways. If you read the part I didn't read, if you read the rest of chapter 18, you'll notice that everybody on earth mourns the fact that Babylon is finished. The kings of the earth will mourn, and the sea captains will mourn, and the shipwrights will mourn, and the merchants will mourn. Everybody mourns that Babylon is defeated. Because here's the trick. We like being successful, and we like having successful children, and we like being respectable by the world's standards, and we like all that comes with our wealth and our privilege. We really like it. And this is all summed up in verse 23 where it says, For your merchants were the magnates of the earth, and all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. What Revelation is trying to say is that we are all kind of deceived by Babylon, and we all kind of like Babylon, and we're all kind of living in Babylon. But the good news is that we... That the good news is this, and we desperately need to hear this as a society. The good news is that we can leave Babylon, and Babylon has been defeated. We know that because Easter Sunday is right around the corner. No, I haven't written my sermon for it yet. Another statistic. The, the National Institute of Health said that among 13 to 18-year-olds, chronic anxiety has gone up 20%. That should force us to ask ourselves, what are we doing to our kids and our grandkids? What about our society is making our kids and our grandkids this chronically anxious? It should force us to ask that question, and then it should make us stop and think about how can we not live that way as the the body of Christ in this world? How can we fight this Babylon thinking as the body of Christ in this world and resist these these urges to give in to Babylon thinking, which just gives us more depression and more anxiety and more addiction? What ways are we living like we belong in Babylon instead of living like we belong in Christ? Today we hear God's gracious invitation, and it's a gracious invitation because it says to us that Babylon is not the be-all and end-all. Rome is not the be-all and end-all. Our culture, all the good and all the bad, is not the be-all and end-all. And God says to us, you can leave. By your baptism, you are given permission and power and guidance by the Holy Spirit to live a different life It is good news. It is good news that right in verse 2, the angel says, Fallen, fallen is Babylon. 
Fallen is all of Babylon's thinking. Fallen is all of Babylon's culture. Fallen is all of that that leads to addiction and death and anxiety and depression. Easter Sunday is right around the corner, and God has won the victory in Easter and on the cross. And we now have permission to not live like we're in Babylon. Amen. If you would please stand for our dialogue after the sermon. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. For the prayers, I will say, I will end each petition on, let us pray to the Lord, and you will say, Lord, have mercy. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For the health of the creation, for abundant harvests that all may share, and for peaceful times, especially in Ukraine, let us pray to the Lord. For public servants, the government, and for those who protect us, for those who work to bring peace, justice, healing, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For those who travel, and for those who are sick and suffering, and for those who are in captivity, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, For deliverance in the time of affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. For our bishops, Elizabeth and Suzanne, for all servants of the church, for this assembly, and for all people who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Giving thanks for all who have gone before us and are at rest, rejoicing in the communion of all the saints, we commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. O God, you have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. May the Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve us. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.